Um, I'm the chair of the Urban Design Group, Katja Stille, and I will give a short welcome, and then I hand over to our chair for the day. Um, I'm really glad you can join us for this lunchtime launch of a major new report from the Place Alliance, which is examining design skills and design governance approaches in England's local planning authorities. It was funded by the Urban Design Group and supported by the Design Council. As you will know, the UDG is a charity supported by volunteers. And the funding for the two surveys comes from the surpluses made on the International Urban Design Group study tours organized and led by Alan Stones over a period of decades. And we are very grateful to him for his past and continuing efforts in trying to raise aspirations for better towns and cities and take us on a lot of really exciting study tours. The first survey published in 2018 found a serious design shortage. Almost half of local planning authorities had no dedicated in-house design capacity at all. The survey report warned that the absence of design expertise locally will result in a new generation of substandard development. The Place Alliance went on to assess the impacts of the skill shortage with a housing audit published in 2019. Over 140 housing developments across England were assessed. They were overwhelmingly mediocre or poor. We know that once a development has been built, it is pretty much there forever. We are, but we are continuing to create a legacy of poorly located and poorly designed housing developments where car ownership and use is not a choice, but a necessity, where the needs of people come second to those of vehicles and operational requirements for refuse kind of collection, where inactivity and high carbon lifestyles are designed in. We know we can do much better. We see examples across the country where we do better and we must do better. Today's launch is very timely given the government's announcement earlier in the week, the launch of the new NPPF for England, the National Model Design Code and the new Office of Place. While the new NPPF gives support to design quality, many of us remain concerned about the resources and skills within local authorities to deliver this. In some areas of the country, resources and skills are one issue, but also economic considerations the lack of econom economic activity and low values, low employment levels and low market values can also undermine quality aspirations as any development might be seen to be better than nothing. We need to ensure that local authorities across the country have the support, the resources, the skill, skill levels, but also the confidence to demand only the best for their communities. At the UDG, we have started a program to support local government officers involved in design. We call it the, officers, the, the Design Officers Network. It's early days, but the first event took place a few weeks ago with 140 officers from across the country attending. We hope to build on that first meeting and to do our part to support officers on the call phase of delivering development on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, we will find out whether or not local authorities in England have the skills and the resources to turn the policies into reality. And now it's enough for me. I hand over to Laura Alvarez, who will be the chair for today's event. And we will see kind of what's coming out of Matthew's survey. Thank you for joining us. Oh, okay, I think we might have lost Laura. Um, we have a little bit of a kind of bandwidth issue. Um, so I will hand over to Matthew. And I mean, I think Matthew doesn't really need much of an introduction. We all know him. We know his excellent work. And I think we're all really curious to hear, hear the results of the survey. So Matthew, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, hopefully you can see my screen now. And let's start. Um, I can get it to work. There we are. Uh, let's start by going back in time uh, a little bit, pre-COVID, pre-Brexit, pre-Boris to uh, 2017. 
uh, when under Theresa May, the, uh, the government became interested once again uh, in design quality. Uh, and at that time, we just published uh, an earlier report that uh, you referred to, Katia, uh, on design skills in English local authorities, which concluded that urban design skills are woefully low and declining, uh, and critical gaps exist within local planning authorities, including the ability to produce proactive design guidance in-house. Since then, uh, and as demonstrated through the various announcements on Tuesday, design quality has increasingly come back onto the national agenda. And the aspirations are now clear to move from uh, substandard places uh, to high quality, beautiful and sustainable buildings and places. But of course, the reality, as the housing uh, design audit revealed, is too often still substandard. Importantly, the audit also revealed that those local authorities that engage most directly in design uh, are also those that are delivering the best quality outcomes in terms of urban design quality. So design capacity in local planning authorities really does matter. So where are we now in uh, 2021 um, and how have design skills in local planning uh, authorities changed during this period uh, since uh, 2017 of heightened uh, national ambition on this front? To investigate, uh, we used a freedom of information uh, request to all 322 uh, local planning authorities. Uh, and after some cajoling, uh, we got a 71% response rate, so a very high response rate, and a big thanks to all of those uh, who responded to the survey, as well as to my colleague uh, Valentina Giordano for all her great work in uh, putting together the survey and ensuring such a great response rate. The survey itself uh, comes in five parts. Uh, covering in-house capacity, change over time and recruitment, design review and design codes, community engagement in design and design guidance training and champions. And uh, I'll use that structure to structure my presentation and forgive me, I'll be throwing quite a few figures uh, your way, but hopefully some clear messages too. We started by asking what in-house design skills do you uh, currently have? And the good news is that nationally, the numbers of urban designers and architects uh, in local planning authorities has stabilized, um, although the availability of landscape expertise continues to decline. The bad news is that today, two fifths of local planning authorities still have no access at all to any uh, design advice, um, any, any urban design advice, two thirds uh, no access to any landscape uh, advice, and three quarters uh, to no access to any urban architectural advice. So we asked if you don't have any in-house capacity, how do you cover these skills requirements? And the first point to make uh, here uh, is um, well made in uh, a quote um, that uh, even the headline figures hide the true extent of the deficit, given the increase, increased sharing of posts, uh, the use of temporary staff, and the coverage of design by non-specialists. There's also a significant increase in the use of external consultants and agency staff to try and fill the gaps, with two fifths of local authorities attempting to do this. And design review is often also seen as a means of filling design skills gaps rather than a means of supplementing and supporting in-house design capacity that already exists. The use of consultants, either on behalf of local authorities or, or, or sort of uh, by developers, rises to 60% in relation to the production of proactive design guidance and frameworks, and to 70% in relation to the preparation of design codes. And this is of significant concern to local authorities for uh, whom a general feeling existed uh, echoed uh, in this comment that the local knowledge of in-house staff is invaluable 
and much more cost effective than using consultants, despite the fact that, of course, we have many brilliant consultants. Now, when we asked about how in-house capacity had changed, uh, we saw a very slight uh, increase in capacity nationally. Uh, if we spread the design specialists working in local planning authorities evenly across the country, uh, then in 2017, we had 1.6 uh, urban designers per authority. Uh, and now we have 1.7. Um, put it another way, in that time, in that period, we have just 30 rather funky looking new uh, design staff uh, spread across all the local authorities in the country. And because most of these are in the few local authorities that already have larger design teams, in fact, only 10 local authorities now have design expertise when previously, uh, in our previous survey, they did not. At this rate of change, it will take until 2077 for every local authority in England to have access to some in-house design expertise. So whilst a minority of local authorities have made a strategic investment in creating a place quality team, the survey revealed that many authorities are unable to do so because of funding difficulties. In this context, authorities overwhelmingly describe recruitment of urban design staff as also very challenging, particularly with regard to their ability to compete with the private sector. Next, we asked uh, about the use of temporary staff to help fill gaps. And authorities told us that uh, whilst the employment of temporary staff can help to smooth bumps in workload, on the whole, authorities would prefer to build their own capacity uh, and with it continuity in knowledge and experience in house. One respondent put it particularly well, uh, continuity of knowledge is hugely valuable for local authorities, but undervalued as it's not represented on a spreadsheet. We asked next about the two tools of urban design governance that, most, that were most strongly associated in the housing design audit with better quality design, up, design outcomes, namely design codes and the use of design review. We found that uh, the use of design review continues to rise and national coverage to improve, although still only a quarter use design review regularly, meaning at least quarterly, whilst two fifths uh, never uh, or only very rarely use design review. It seems that uh, a lack of awareness still persists about the value of design review to improve design quality outcomes and particular, particularly over its potential to be cost neutral to local authorities. Mapping practices across England nevertheless reveals uh, a more comprehensive national picture of authorities using design review panels than in 2017, although also a geographical uh, 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 uneven spread, if you like. Uh, so few places outside of London and parts of the Southeast use design review regularly, meaning uh, uh, at least quarterly. More often design review is used intermittently. That's all those places that you can see in orange. And notable absences in the use of design review persist through large parts of the East, Northwest, swathes of the South and Southwest and across the West Midlands. Interestingly, uh, the increased uh, amount of review overall has been accompanied by a decline in the number of internally managed panels, uh, those are panels managed within local authorities themselves, in favour of externally managed panels, uh, and these now account for two thirds of design review. Turning to design codes, very much in, uh, on the national agenda at the moment, as we know, the use of design codes has also continued to rise with three quarters of local authorities now having at least some experience of their use. Uh, although most local authorities who use them either require or encourage uh, developers to produce codes with only 14% produced uh, in-house. So a relatively small number of codes actually produced within local authorities themselves. This time mapping the use of design codes across the country shows 
a widespread distribution in their use with notable concentrations of non-use uh, to the south of London and in parts of the East and the West Midlands. When asked about their likely future practices in light of the new requirement that local authorities should have design codes in place, one third plan to produce design codes in-house, so that's quite an increase on current practice, uh, perhaps reflecting the uh, dissatisfaction that many noted with developer-produced codes. A much smaller number intend to use consultants, um, and a third don't know how they're going to produce or, or fund uh, design codes, particularly if they're required to produce them for their whole local authority area. Interestingly, over half of, of authorities anticipate producing codes uh, only for key sites or areas of change and less than a third for their entire local authority area. And this, this quote, I think, reflects the concerns of many on that front. Uh, we do not completely agree that blanket design codes are the right approach when there are great uh, variations in the physical, socioeconomic and cultural landscape of a place. Turning to community engagement in design, another major theme of the recent planning white paper, uh, today about two thirds of all local authorities use or require local consultation events uh, on major developments, um, but more proactive hands-on engagement in the actual design of development drops off sharply to about a fifth of local authorities using those methods for some sites. On a related concern in the white paper, uh, beyond the use of social media, there's very little evidence of technological approaches being used to encourage a more fundamental engagement of communities in design. Uh, there are, of course, a few notable exceptions. Uh, this uh, authority, for example, plans uh, 3D immersive engagement through a digital model of their whole borough, but there was very, uh, uh, very few examples of such tools being used. More commonly, authorities report being too stretched to, in delivering their sort of minimum statutory duties to take on community engagement in any fundamental role themselves. Instead, typically they look to developers to conduct local consultation events uh, and any hands-on engagement in design. And a very simple message uh, was very widely apparent in the survey that more engagement with the public will require more resources. Coming to the final area we looked at, the use of guidance and training, um, following the cull uh, in 2012 of uh, national guidance, uh, the important role of uh, government in producing such materials has now been firmly re-established. And the new and a few old nationally produced guides uh, on design are seen as uh, playing an important role in guiding local decision making once again. Actually, this marked quite a change from the 2017 survey, where very few local authorities seem to be using even the old design guides that existed at that time. In addition, almost three quarters of local authorities use some form of local design guidance of various types in uh, their decision making, sometimes shared across different local authority areas. On training, uh, budget cuts are still eating into training budgets with most design related training focused on raising awareness about design quality rather than on developing new design skills. Uh, for their part, councillors receive some informal training on design in just over half of local authorities, but it's typically very basic indeed. Uh, and finally, only a small percentage of councils have a designated design or place champion to promote design quality across the authority at large. Although positively, those that do strongly recommend such roles as key to help build a sort of corporate commitment to quality and generally a culture of good design. So to conclude, like all good reports, we finish this one with some recommendations. Uh, some of which we might uh, come back to in the discussion as we have time. Um, first, for government, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of these, I'll just uh, select a few. Um, the uh, first one is the need to establish a new dedicated and generous funding stream for raising design skills in local planning authorities. And receipt of this funding should be tied 
to local authorities themselves submitting a plan for resourcing in-house design expertise over the long term. Government in the past has uh, had dedicated funds for design skills, but it's tended to be fairly small and time limited. And as soon as the, the funding runs out, the, the posts seem to go with them. Uh, uh, we've just seen an amendment to the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, it's a shame it didn't include this, which is uh, a policy to uh, make early and independent design review mandatory for all major developments. Uh, we've seen overwhelming evidence that design review really does make a, a, a positive improvement in design and should be far more stressed in government guidance and policy. And as part of the government's levelling up agenda, uh, the government should consider a light touch fund for the conduct of design review and the preparation of design go codes beyond the current pilot programme in those parts of the country where practices are least developed. And there are quite a few holes in the country where there's, there's very few design codes or design review being used at all. Some recommendations for the brand new office uh, for place uh, launch just uh, on Tuesday. Um, they should consider st establishing a proactive enabling function that will reach out to local planning authorities and assist them directly in the production and or commissioning of design codes in-house. Joanna Averley, our, 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 who we're here from soon, uh, managed a, brilliantly managed uh, a, a similar service back in the old days of CABE, which had incredible impacts and we should consider having such an, an enabling service back again. Um, second, might think about establishing a national charrette programme through which effective but efficient methods of engaging communities in design are developed uh, and promoted. There's really no substitute for engaging communities directly into, in design if we, if we want to know what they think about uh, design quality. And a program of executive level training for chief officers, chief executives and leaders of councils should be devised, focused on culture change and local leadership relating to place quality. It's all about that culture of quality and that needs to come from the top. And then last but definitely not least for local government, Fundamentally, all local authorities should invest in in-house design expertise appropriate to the size of their planning team with a remit to prepare or commission design frameworks, codes and guidance, conduct or commission design review and community engagement, offer advice to planning staff on all major developments, implement government guidance on design and generally raise and support local design quality ambitions. And to do that, we recommend the ratio of design specialist staff to other professional planning staff of one to 10 is a reasonable aspiration to work to. And then finally, consider establishing local, uh, establishing local community panels to engage citizens in an ongoing conversation about design quality beyond the usual suspects who get involved in, in these issues. So that's all from me. Thank you very much uh, to listening to me. If you want to download the, the, uh, the report in its full glory, then if you go to placealliance.org.uk, you can do that there. Thank you very much. Back to Kaki. Thank you, Matthew. Um, let me just check if Laura... Yes, I'm here. Hello. Oh. <laughs> you take over. <laughs> Yes, hi, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I have to apologise. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have bad connections here because I'm actually on holiday. I am in North Cornwall in the middle of a heat wave. So um, you can appreciate how much dedication uh, to be here instead of being at the beach. But uh, no, I couldn't miss this for the world. Thank you, Matthew, for that. Really, really good to see. It's always fascinating to see what changes and what doesn't in this um, service, which I follow very carefully. And we absolutely need to start from knowing where we stand in terms of skills and resources, because it's a theme that keeps coming back and back um, in every event that I have been uh, participating in, training course, the thing that comes back is skills and resources. Um, perhaps uh, and it's not a surprise. This type of research I find really incredibly helpful at a local authority level. I don't know if other authorities use it or not, but we use it to plan and to check our performance and our skills um, and our, our staff infra infrastructure against the national and regional average. We find it really useful. So if you're not doing that, I, I do recommend that. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention. 
before we move on to the responses. Well, I had a lot to say before Matthew was uh, going to speak, but my, my internet failed, so apologies for that. We know there's not the, a matter of having the skills available at the local authority level, but it's, it's having the right skills at the right place. So we need to go on to the final grain of what skills are necessary. And particularly because, as Matthew said, there's great variances regionally, and recruitment in, recruitment in some parts are really, really difficult. So maybe we need the next step of this survey and go, go into finer detail and find out what that texture is for the skills that are necessary. Um, those who work in local authority maybe have also experienced a huge lack of skills among applicants and graduates and the local authorities are absorbing somehow the role of designers, They're having to, to shape and transform everything the lands are planning uh, or a lot of what lands are planning submission stage because the design quality is not quite right, which raises the question of the adequacy of the current higher education curricula, which clearly does not prepare graduates for working in the UK, but is more interested in the commercial aspects of higher education to international students, leaving graduates in the UK not knowing what they do not know and having the local authorities having to pick up those gaps. A critical part of the problem is that and finding that balance and how we address that, I think is a big task for the office of for place but uh, a lot to think about there um let's now go to the responses I, I could talk all day but we haven't got much time so i'm going to pass it over uh, we will begin with joanna Everly, chief planner of mhclg with the response and comments to matthew's work Thank you, Laura. And first of all, can I just say a huge word of thanks to, to Matthew and the team at um, Urban Design Group who've commissioned the research. It's so important that we aren't working on anecdote, but they're working on evidence of, of the capacity and capability in local government and more generally across the industry. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of context, um, really on the back of the announcement on Tuesday, and then uh, we'll open out to sort of uh, uh, questions and uh, very happy to take uh, questions from everyone who's involved today. So, Personally, um, as Matthew alluded to, I've been in this space for a very long time talking about how we as an industry, as local planning authorities, as communities, as professionals, no matter where you sit in the industry, whether you're a developer, a consultant or a local planning authority or, or a community representative, how we pursue creating better uh, design places um, for quite some time. And, and I think the moment we've got uh, in the announcements that were made on Tuesday is really quite pivotal. Um, I'm not saying it um, uh, for effect, but I, I say it sort of reflecting on the policy position. So just to expand on what I mean by that, um, the updates to the MPPF um, are really clear and are on the back of all the good work that Nicholas and the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission did in sort of doing that really forensic look at how we can ensure that the planning system and the policy framework for planning pursues uh, uh, not just development for development's sake, but development which delivers really positive outcomes in terms of uh, uh, placemaking, beauty and sustainability. And and therefore, the MPPF has had that sort of that sort of forensic sort of surgery, I suppose, be one way of looking at it, to make sure that it really uh, uh, gives local planning authorities and councillors the basis on which to make good decisions. So I would really commend that to everyone who's on the call. It might seem incredibly technical uh, to engage at that level, but I'll, I'll highlight a few uh, particular changes which which uh, I think are particularly relevant to this conversation. And I'll do that in a minute. So the other thing that we um, published on Tuesday was the National Model Design Code, which is the, the daughter document to the National Design Guide. And that really, to me, is, is just the, it's a brilliant catalogue and toolkit for how we all as practitioners think about placemaking in the round, not from a sort of specialist angle, because somebody might be interested in street design or the design of the home or the design of landscape, um, or how people might move around places and the dominance of, 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 dominance of um, uh, engineering over uh, design for people. But it genuinely addresses the entire catalogue of issues that we as urban designers, planners, developers, and, and landscape architects all need to sort of be thinking about in a holistic sense. So 
that's a really important document. So both those two are live now in the planning system as of Tuesday. Um, and I'm just going to link them together in terms of talking about two, two um, important paragraphs in the MPPF. And I'll be very technical and I'll point you to the two paragraphs in particular. Paragraphs 128 and 129. So the first one is basically, basically saying that all local authorities should prepare design guides or codes consistent with the principles of the National Design Guide and the National Model Design Code, which reflect local character and design preferences. So there you have it. In the current planning system, um, uh, there is the, the drive and the expectation as we've seen, you know, many local authorities, I think uh, Matthew's work is saying about three quarters of local authorities are doing something in this space already. They're already using uh, strong guidance to sort of shape development. But I suppose what we've, we've got in the National Model Design Code is, as I say, that sort of holistic view, which is current and up to date in terms of the issues we have to address um, also for climate change, biodiversity net gain and other aspects um, that are very current for us today. Right, paragraph 129, I'm also going to point you towards, luckily, straight off to paragraph 128. Uh, and that basically says that na the National Design Guide and the National Model Design Code should also be used to guide decisions on planning applications in the absence of locally produced guides or codes. So that's just a really, again, important point to make that this is sits behind all of all of us as professionals in terms of our decisions, whether we're designing, whether we're design reviewing, whether we're um, looking at a planning application. Um, this is design guidance that has it, it, um, should be actively used in the current system. Um, so taking this now to aspects of, of capacity and um, capability in local government who sit at the heart of, of this agenda. Um, so as you know, we've already launched 14 um, pilots and we've been working with 14 local authorities. And I suppose just what I'm, I want to reflect on really positively is, is some of the things that Matthew was saying about how um, there might be a bit of a way to go in terms of how we use digital tools, in terms of how we engage communities meaningfully in the preparation of design codes. And all of those uh, first wave of pilots are doing something in that space. Um, they're not going to be comprehensive. Um, it's a sort of first set of, of pilots who are sort of really looking at the National Model Design Code and looking at, looking at its applicability to them, sometimes in a particular physical context. So one is the used burn in Newcastle, so that's a very particular urban context. The other one, for example, is, is the whole of Herefordshire. So we're looking at coding at different geographical scales, and different, different, different physical contexts and, and uh, also different market contexts as well. So that's, but that's starting to show, and I'm really struck by how the local authorities already are looking at some of these aspects about engagement, digital engagement, and how it works for them. But also on Tuesday, we launched another um, expression of interest um, for a further set of pilots. And I'd really encourage uh, colleagues on this call to take a look at that. Now, um, we're not doing these pilots just for the sake of the local authorities who benefit from just having a bit of an investment and resource to do some focused work. But our objective is to very clearly draw out the lessons from, from those pilots, share it more widely, and for us all together to sort of learn from those active um, um, projects and then um, put that information out there. Um, and then finally, just, um, and I'll, it's a sort of good way to hand on to Nicholas. Um, uh, the Office for Place has been established uh, within this format, within the, uh, uh, within MHCLG as a dedicated team. Um, we are uh, working through the pilots. We've obviously been working on the National Model Design Code and supported very ably by the advisory panel, which is chaired by Nicholas. So again, uh, with, with Nicholas and the board, which the advisory board, which includes uh, many uh, colleagues who you'll be very familiar with who've been in this space for a long time, uh, I think we've got uh, an astonishing set of expertise around the table to sort of guide us and really help us think through how we mobilize these issues. Um, what is also very, very apparent to me, and I think it's, again, it's this point of, of real emphasis I want to make, which is just the um, uh, the drive um, from our Secretary of State on design, quality, placemaking and beauty. Um, I've been around long enough to have observed a few 
uh, uh, different political perspectives on this. Um, and it's a really powerful and meaningful moment, I think, for all of us as practitioners. And it's a moment to really grasp. Um, and I'm very conscious that uh, Matthew has presented also the issues and the challenges for everyone in terms of resources and capacity and capability. And Laura, I think, you, I think your observation was really, really interesting about the planners that are being created and, and formed and uh, within our education system and how they continue to learn um, through their through their professional lives. Um, and if 50 percent of local authorities are relying on planners, then it's also how we upskill people. Um, who might not have, have a full urban design qualification, but we upskill them to ask the right questions to know where to seek help. And as Matthew was saying, to be able to draw on things like design review panels when that's right. Um, and, and be active and be proactive and confident in, in both being able to define the things that are important for a local area, but then know how to question proposals that are put in front of them. And very finally, um, the MPPF does something um, incredibly powerful, which it basically says now, uh, uh, a local authority can make a proactive decision to turn something down because it's not good enough in terms of design quality and obviously permit things that are of good quality. That's uh, something that people have been asking for for a long time. So there's lots in there that I can talk about further, but I just sort of give you those introductory comments. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That's really, really, really useful. I'm going to go after this and start reading, although I should be at the beach. But thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm tempted to go and read everything that you mentioned, and especially this new set of pilots. I'm interested in seeing what that is all about. Um, thank you, Joanna. Um, you, you mentioned something about training and upskilling at local authority level. I think that there's um, we must make some sort of emphasis at um, leadership level in that there isn't a culture in many local authorities of training and CPD. There is this, this view that um, the planners are so uh, loaded with work and they, they are so overworked and they haven't got the time to do the CPDs or the funding for that. Uh, the first thing that went through the pandemic was uh, funding for conferences and, you know, creative thinking comes from sharing ideas and talking to other people. So I think one of the jobs for the office will be to relook at this and how do we address this issue with creating that culture, local authority level, that the world is changing so fast. And if we're going to be carbon, you know, uh, offset that carbon, we need to really be learning all the time. And, and we need to have people uh, on continuous training. That is put, just, that just is I think that's absolutely right, Lauren. Just to respond to that, I think I think I think all of this is, and this is my learning from from all the roles I've done. It does take a collective effort, and you know, um, I think I think it's not about. I mean, the office for place will play a, a really important leadership role, um, but also we can we can all mobilise, whether it's the urban design group or or um, uh, Esther and Urban Design London's just been running code schools. So uh, I think it's also just about making sure we've got that energy as an industry and, and, and us all playing to our strengths in terms of what we can bring to the, bring to the, the agenda and the, the objectives, that we, our common objectives that we've all got. Thank you very much. Right, um, the next um, response is from Alan Jones. For, uh, no, it's, uh, sorry about that. It's from Nicholas Boy smith uh, from Create Streets and Office for Place Transition Board Chair which is, uh, I suppose, pretty new. Um, Thank you, Laura. Hello. Pretty can, I, new. Can, you, can you hear me? I always, you always have to start with that. So yes. Someone's nodding. Excellent. Thank someone's you. Nodding. Um, listen, thank you, Laura. Well done for coming in from the beach from Cornwall. Uh, you're, you're obviously dedicated but bonkers. Um, thank you to Matthew and all your colleagues, uh, you know, for a really, as always, I have to say, with the work Matthew's involved with, a really useful and uh, powerful piece of work. And I very much echo what Joanna said, that, you know, it's much better to... Uh, try and make changes based on evidence rather than hearsay. So, yeah, you know, uh, thank you for that. What I'll do, if I may, um, and uh, Laura, it's your job to shut me up if I'm going on too long, I'll try not to, but I'll just perhaps make a few points in response to Matthew's presentation and his report. Um, and actually one of them will hopefully pick up a couple of the questions I've seen in the chat as well. I'll just make four or five quick points. And then I will just go through for a couple of minutes the slides I used on Tuesday, not not all of them, um, but just the, just the two or three that focused on the office of place. So, uh, if you want the, uh, the the full the full talk that Secretary Satan and I made, I will put that into the chat subsequently. Um, so, the first point I would make um, was actually, I mean, maybe this is a reflection of my, my character rather than reality, but you know, I actually found I found the report reasonably reassuring. So, if you're, you know stabilised, more use of national guidance and increasing use of codes. So, I think that's that is to be welcomed. Um, the, uh, you know, I was very struck when I was going around the country about a year and a half ago as part of B4C work, 
um, yeah, how variable the focus on design quality and the understanding about the relationship between the places we live in and public health and well-being and social connectedness was. Um, at its best, in a couple of London and boroughs, it was pretty good. I have to say at its worst, it was pretty bad. Um, and the level of even awareness that it was an issue uh, was, was pretty poor. And that's not just, I mean, there is a capacity issue there, but I'm afraid it was more than capacity. And for understandable reasons, uh, you know, some of the councils I, I spoke to, you know, were in the framework of we need investment in our bit of the world. This is investment, therefore this is good. Um, and I'm afraid, as you all know, that's not correct. Um, so I think if we're starting to turn the corner on that, I think that is to be welcomed. Uh, the second thing I'd say, I think uh, Matthew's respondents are right to be wanting to do this predominantly in-house rather than using consultants. Again, there are lots of good consultants out there. Um, but it's it's right to make, to want to make the skills in, in, you know, endemic and installed inside the public sector as, as well as the private sector. Um, that does have, uh, I think, consequences for uh, required uh, capacity and you know, volume of skills. Uh, look, I'm chairing the Office of Place Advisory Board. I'm, I'm not a minister or an official, so I can't wave a magic wand on that. But when I, you know, I can say this because it's a public fact, when I asked the Secretary of State about this in a public webinar, webinar uh, I think back in September of last year in the Great Streets Conference, exactly that point, he said, yes, I recognise the need for, uh, for more capacity there. So I think that is that's recognised. I, th I think Joanna came close to saying the same, but I, I won't put words into her mouth. I wouldn't dare. Um, and Secretary State said it. So yeah, I think the point is made. Obviously, what flows through is is a different discussion. But you know, I think that's 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 to be welcomed. Um, I would also add. And I've got a slide on this, but I won't, I won't come to it yet. Um, I would add that when we do what we do as designers and as planners and as people invested in the quality of the places that people live in is absolutely critical and by that I mean to what degree do we rely on the development control process which is inherently quite time consuming way to control place quality and to what degree degree do we rely on strategic planning and the quality of the local plan and and indeed who feeds into that and the reason that certainly I personally think that design codes or things that are quite visual and numerical and comprehensible to the general public are important is there a way of getting away from you know discussions about urban morphology or block form or you know uh transport transport you know systemic change words that frankly wash over most people and don't have inherent meaning into you know what a place feels like to live in and look like um but what we do have in this country, and Matthew and Joanna, I apologise, you've heard me say this before, is we do have a system that relies in international and comparative terms, actually also in historical terms in terms of this country, very disproportionately on development control, and very to a very low degree on strategic planning and place setting and setting clear frameworks. Um, if you look at the equivalent of local plans in most other countries, they are much firmer. Increasingly, they are more visual as well, as, as hopefully ours will become. So, uh, uh, you yeah, know, to, to the way to use the capacity we've got is clearly to use it as strategically as possible. And that won't cover all situations. There are always going to be funny cases. Um, and hopefully the, um, but it, you know, it can, it can and should cover the good ordinary. And hopefully the new MPPF and the National Model Design Code will make that easier. And then obviously there's a wider discussion about planning reform. Um, one more sort of general point before I show a couple of slides. Uh, you made the point at the end of your excellent presentation, Matthew, about um, levelling up. Um, I mean, I think there is a real... Uh, uh, discussion to be had to what degree, I and mean, obviously jobs is an important part of that, but place quality is as well. Um, to what degree is levelling up expenditure and focus about big infrastructure? There's a role for that. And to what degree is it about helping places that have been left behind by systemic change in the last 50 years to rediscover, rediscover their place quality as places in which if you've got some get up and go, you don't get up and go, you might get up and come back. Uh, or in which people would be attracted by perhaps the lower, lower prices. Um, so the social enterprise I run, Create Streets, we're working in a range of, you know, left behind places in inverted commas, um, you know, that as is shown by the data, they are less good places to live. You know, they have dirtier air. Uh, they have less uh, walkable streets. Uh, they're in less good state. Um, and uh, I think how we approach that, perhaps link that levelling up agenda to the placemaker agenda and to creating more homes is very important. And again, I think there's an important moment here, and it's not just about planning reform and the focus of the government on this. I think it's also about the uh, the focus on levelling up. And because of post-COVID, do we have a situation, we don't know yet, but do we have a situation in which towns and villages, coastal towns, uh, places which are very underpopulated compared to their urban infrastructure, 
could actually start being a more attractive places for more people to live and work and run their lives. Many of the industrial towns of this country are at population levels about 50% of what they were 60, 70 years ago. Now, some of that is probably overcrowding that is rightly is, is rightly removed. But some of it is actually, I think, an opportunity for more places to live there with existing infrastructure. So those are just a few, a, a few uh, top level responses. Let me just try and share my screen. Always a nervous moment. I can't, of course, now see my PowerPoint. Bear with me. I'm just trying to get this right. Um, there it is. Hopefully that is coming up. I'm just trying to move on to one screen. Is that, has that come up? Yeah, yes, brilliant. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hang on. So my, my screen is freezing. So I'm not going to talk to this slide. I'm just, I'm just going to try and move some, all your pictures there um, in detail. But this is the point I was making earlier, uh, which is that our local plans historically have been quite strange documents. Uh, less certain, more verbal, less visual. And I think uh, as the fun focus on design codes improves in the years to come, hopefully that is something we can uh, partly rectify to allow the good ordinary to be done a little bit more time efficiently. I think the other important point to make is that we are operating in a situation of very low trust in the process, both developers and planners. In situations of, of large developments, we're at between 2 to 7% trust for developers and planners. So there is an important level of public trust to re-establish. Uh, I realize, again, we can't wave magic wands on that. One of the reasons that people have lost trust in the system, I think understandably, is that they're not confident that what's said at the start of the process is what will happen at the end. So if we can collectively, as a society and as a various professions, try and increase certainty and clarity as what will happen, I think that's important. On the Office for Place, um, we've set three key points to the vision. Uh, one is... Uh, actually to catalyze a fundamental change across all the sectors in you know, supporting the creation of and the stewarding of better places. Two is to help neighborhoods and those and communities and those who work on their behalf, such as many of you, uh, to do so. And again, with very clear outcomes, places that are beautiful, popular, healthy, and sustainable. And then finally, actually, as the information available on the quality of places and the link to well-being and outcomes, something Matthew knows a lot about, improves and will continue to improve i think in the years to come is actually to help support british industry design and development to be some of the best place makers in the world so that's if you like that's our vision i'm conscious of time i will, I will speed up um i won't go through all the names but we've got a very expert body to support me and joanna and the team uh from a range of uh, perspectives and with a lot of private and public sector experience and also critically uh, running or involved with running some of the the, the network of, of of organizations such as urban design london who, who are very involved in helping support both the public and the private sectors. We've set five principles, and I think this is some of these are very much a response, uh, actually to some of Matthew's former work, but also to some of the points Matthew was making. Empirical, empowering, uh, flexible, uh, uh, networked, and digital. I'll just perhaps pick out on the um, empirical and the empowering. Um, there's great information out there about what makes for good places, and most people don't know it. And I include most professionals in that, and certainly most councillors and certainly most officials and certainly most developers. So I think part of the job, and I've written books on it, and I know that some of you have, part of the job is to stop this information being trapped in some of our minds and in a few slightly ill-read Ill, Ill books, in all honesty, certainly mine are ill-read, um, and get them more spontaneously and easily into the public debate and awareness. And get not just the design officers, but their bosses uh, and the local planning authority heads and the head of housing and the head of networks and head of all sorts of things. Um, empowering, and I, again, I really stress this point, you know, the, the office of place is not going to be a huge team of hundreds and hundreds. I don't think that would be sensible. I don't think it'd be helpful. We, we're going to be quite a small team. But what we do want to do is be empowering others and helping and supporting them, whether that's third sector, private sector, public sector, um, to nurture the capacity that what we needed to help facility, uh, to facilitate the provision of design codes and better design. So it's about empowering neighbourhoods, parishes, communities, civic society and councils. Uh, and I'll, I'll jump over the others because I'm, I'm conscious of time. These are the five key activities we've set ourselves over the first few years. And I'm going to just uh, focus on the first two, researching, supporting and accrediting, um, because I think those are the most urgent. So understanding what evidence is needed, measuring what people like, what they, where they, what they need, where they prosper, and above all, making that available. I think responding to one of the points in the report, mapping skills and capacities of LPAs and others. So thank you, Matthew. It's a head start today. Uh, Esther and Adrian Penfold, Esther and Adrian Penfold in particular will be leading that work. 
and then trying to work out, well, what are the business models for delivering design codes, for bringing more visual clarity and certainty into the local plan? We know now, I think great work done by CABE and others over the last uh, 20 years, uh, we know now how design uh, review can work. So there's an established process for doing that. We need to get it into more of the country, but it, you know, we, we can see how we make that work. What's the, what's the right route for doing design codes? How are we to make sure we have a rich infrastructure of provision and a good market for that? Just on supporting the crediting, and then I'll draw to close. Um, I think what we're looking at investigating uh, among the working groups is a kite mark for excellence, KPIs, um, perhaps how-to templates. I don't think we would necessarily, we the office of place, would write all of those. We might write some. We'll probably commission others to write. We may encourage others to write. Sharing best practice. And then this is partly a response to Matthew's point about training. Because I think I'd say training and. Um, and I certainly point, agree with the point of uh, people in senior places. But all the evidence I've seen suggests that the, one of the best ways of, of training in inverted commas is actually getting people to tell their war stories. What worked, what didn't work, what they would do differently. So helping find those and help share them in forums such as this, working with a, a design group and many others. But also, I think, writing job descriptions and, and KPIs. I, I used to run the, um, uh, I guess, the um, KPIs for, for, for a major bank once. And what measures, what people are targeted on, on and measured on does matter. And we see in many situations, uh, officials very much focused very on uh, how fast things can get through a town, on elements of transport, not necessarily on elements of place. So what are the right ways in which officials, perhaps beyond the planning team, uh, can be thinking about the quality of place. And that, I think, will also be something that will hopefully percolate through to, um, uh, to, to, to councillors. I'll stop there because I'm conscious of time. I um, was just about to say <laughs> thank you thank very you. Sorry much. About, sorry about and that. Thank I'm just trying to stop thanks for wrapping the screen. Up. I, very, there. very quickly, because we have we are running out of time, very interesting in, to hear in Alan as well. Um, the themes are keep coming up, very, very interesting conversation. Maybe we should record this as well and have a look at it and expand on it at future events. Um, to uh, Design codes is the main thing that keeps mentioned. Um, the fact that, uh, the, of course, skills to produce design codes. By the way, there are some very, very good uh, design code schools now. Have a look at that. But also the fact that there is a, a team that will produce the design code, another team who has to interpret it and apply it, and then how that design code will be evaluated and how those three steps could be lost in translation. So keep an eye on that and how we're going to manage that. Another thing that keeps coming up is the need, the different needs of different authorities and the, almost the worry that a national um, office might miss out what happens at the local level and how is that going to be managed and if there's going to be regional variances or, or how do we create that fine grain to see how um, different authorities have different needs uh, to address. Right, uh, I think the principles are brilliant actually. But let's move on because time's running out. And last but not least, we have Alan Stones, for, uh, former editor of the Essex Design Guide and head of the Essex Design Guide service. I'm very looking forward to this, um, Alan. Believe it or not, the Essex Design Guide was so influential that it was a case study at my urban design course in South America. So you can probably see how I want, I really want to hear from you. So I pass on to you, Alan. Thank you, Laura. Um, what I, I'm going to say is something about how we got to the state we're in at the moment, because back at the time we produced the 1997 Essex Design Guide, uh, the Essex team uh, consisted of about four uh, mainly architect planners working in conjunction with the conservation team uh, and assisting all the district councils with their larger uh, uh, planning applications. And you may have forgotten about the fact that during the 1990s, there was an earlier government uh, quality in town and country initiative spearheaded by John Gummer. And uh, that created, I think, the uh, uh, positive climate for urban design at the time. Uh, after the guide came out, um, unfortunately, financial constraints at Essex County Council and other councils meant that we had to start charging the districts for the services that we delivered. Uh, not surprisingly, many districts decided they couldn't afford it and dropped out. Uh, one of the side effects of that was that the Essex team needed to find extra work outside the county to uh, keep themselves going. 
today there is about one uh, uh, urban designer left at Ex Essex County Council Place Services, uh, and his work is supplemented by uh, running a design review panel. Uh, districts, some of them buy into the Essex services. Um, many buy in ad hoc urban design advice from consultants. Uh, the downside of that is, of course, a loss of continuity because there aren't the ongoing urban design staff uh, who know what's going on in the area. Uh, there's also a tendency to leave urban design to the planning applicant uh, with all the obvious drawbacks of that, that the urban design input is uh, subordinate to marketing considerations. Uh, those urban design codes and guidance that are still in place and officially adopted by the districts are not always used. Um, and chief executives of district councils are very loath to support appeals uh, on design grounds. So altogether, the system is becoming more and more toothless. Uh, recently, the local amenity society that I'm part of launched an ombudsman complaint uh, against uh, the district council uh, in our area, which had ignored a lot of uh, design guide or design brief uh, criteria uh, on, the on, on the basis that they were not doing their job. We still await the outcome of that uh, ombudsman complaint to see whether it's upheld. So at the moment, uh, we have in our area an unprecedented amount of large housing applications uh, and local planning authorities have never been so unequipped to deal with it. So I welcome the initiatives that are coming from uh, Nicholas and Joanna, and also the work from Matthew and his team, which highlights the parlous position that we as urban designers find ourselves in. Uh, so let's hope we can start from this low level and uh, get back to something like we had in the past. Yes, thank you, Alan. I have to say I totally, totally concur with everything you said. I don't know if I can add anything else. Um, but what I'm looking here in the comments, as, as you were speaking, people worried about political barriers and what you say, not adhering to guidance and codes. Uh, we might have all the, the perfection in, in the codes and, and the guidance, but then what happens uh, on the ground might be different. But that's the nature of our job, isn't it? Right to negotiate constantly. Uh, to push the quality bar, uh, boundary up. Um, we have some people uh, concerned about the level of engagement that is necessary and not only the resources but also the training. We are not ready to go into that level of empowering engagement. We're still on the consultation sort of mindset uh, broadly as local authority. Um, but Matthew has a lot of data on that as well, which was good to see a full session on, on how we would engage. So it's a massive, um, it's one of the principles as well. So empowering, I'm pretty, very happy that it's labeled empowering and not consultation. Um, so that's, that's a critical thing, in my opinion. But would any of the speakers or Katia like to, um, or Matthew as well, presenter, like to add anything else uh, to the conversation? Otherwise, I'm going to go on to looking in more detail to the comments that we have. I think, anything could, I, else? could I just come yeah. back? Um, I mean, I think in a way, Alan's point is very important that this is a cyclical thing that we go through it there's moments when design is seen as important by government and then we forget it and then it's important again and then we forget it and so you know this is no way to run our planning system in this country you know if we're serious about places and the quality of places then we have to have a planning system and planning colleagues that feel empowered to actually insist on, 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 on quality and have the right skills to put in place all the necessary tools, whatever it is, design codes or you know, guidance or, or review or whatever, 
to operate those tools and put them in place to actually deliver on this front. And, and, and it's great that the current governments are, are interested in design. Um, we're at the start of that road. What we need to ensure is that there's no way back. You know, as we invest in design capacity, that it's a sort of one-way street and we never come back to the situation yeah. again where it's suddenly considered not important and other things get priority. Um, Laura, can I, sorry, just, just one word covering. I mean, I think a lot of people have said this. I mean, everybody has said this. And I think one of the key issues came out today for me, and I think it's something we really need to tackle. We need to break the, the link between poor economic, um, you know, strength in areas and design quality. I mean, we, we can't continue delivering for our the, the communities that are less well off also suffering poor quality. I mean, there shouldn't be a link between market value areas and strong economic kind of areas, high employment and so on, and design quality. We really need to kind of break that link that is that exists. Not entirely sure how we do it, but I think yes. everybody deserves the design quality. I, I think critical, I totally agree, Katia. And I, I think critically to, to, to move to a stage where we consider everything holistically and we take sustainability seriously, we need to think of the three spheres. The economic sphere is, is very, very strong because you can quantify and you can become um, accountable for what you're doing. With the other spheres, with the social sphere of, of sustainability, there is very little accountability and things become a nice to have. With, with the environmental is becoming, is tending to, is getting better, but we're still nowhere near where we should be, considering the climate crisis we have. And, and the tools and resources are available as well. So unless we balance the three spheres equally, I don't think we will be able to address this. And when we do, design quality will emerge because you will be forced to look at design quality but from what it actually means. Um, and, and beauty is one of the variables, but by no means beautiful means quality. Uh, probably the other way around, yes. But uh, it's, it's for another debate, and we should actually do a, a full event on, on beauty and quality and what they, how they both interact and link and, um, and what they mean. Because there's a, quite a lot of comments here. What does it mean, beautiful? How do we... Uh, how to get, we count for it. And so, yes, I, I know I keep hearing and, that. Yes. And Laura, just come, in, just come in on that, because I think that's where just looking at the National Design Code is really important for people because it's um, beauty means means the whole panoply of different issues that make mm -hmm. places successful for, for, for us, um, but also make them successful um, uh, for, you know, a climate, whether it's climate resilience or whether it's, you know, the journey towards net zero. So, uh, you know, if you look at the National Design Code, it, 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 it carefully goes through all these issues that are very apparent to us that we need to think about holistically and, 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 and not, as I was mentioning earlier, or not pick out one aspect um, of quality, um, but sort of work across the piece. So I hope sort yeah. of people find that a useful frame. Can I can I yeah. jump in on that quickly as well, please, yes. Laura? Yeah. Thank you, jo thank you, Joanna. And I, I I meant to be in another meeting by now, but it's so interesting. I've stayed, so I'm in, I'm in trouble at the other end now. Um, uh, and I, I noticed someone's just quoted Vitruvius in the chat, which was unexpected. Um, uh, look, I mean, I think uh, the, the point about using beauty alongside issues such as words such as sustainability in the MPPF is to raise our sights. And you know, all of those of you who are interested in the history of planning, which I suspect is quite a few of you, you know, I'm sure will know, you should know, that uh, the British planning system didn't used to be afraid of aspiring for the best for everyone. And I'm afraid we have lost that confidence over the last couple of generations mm -hmm. to actually aim for the sky. We will not normally hit the sky. We won't all agree on what the sky should be. We can have productive discussions. We can have rows about what it is, but as a, as a, as a society, not just a planning system, as a development uh, sector, as a process of governance, we should be aspiring to create great places in which the body can prosper and in which the soul can sing. Um, and if we don't try and do that, we just become purely procedural 
And all public expenditure condition decisions will be made purely on cost, which is what currently happens, and not actually on the value uplift for the people who will live lives there. So, you know, I, for those who find the word difficult, I'm I'm sorry, but I'm only sorry up to a point because um, we do need to lift our lift our lift our rates. And if you if you look at how it was defined, we defined it quite carefully in the in the B4C report uh, a year and a bit ago. We just we defined it very ecumenically, and that was very it was very purposeful and thought through with a wide range of working groups feeding into it. But I, I think it's you know, the, the aim is to be ambitious, I think, because otherwise we will certainly fail. I'll, I'll stop there and I'll just go. Thank you very much. And I, right, if you if you need to go to your other meeting, thank you so much. But if you want to stay, please feel free. I think this is um, getting quite quite active now in the chat room. Who arbitrates is all subjective. Um, then how do you manage beauty when you have permitted development, an interesting one? Um, I mean, this deserves a whole event, doesn't it? I'm sure everybody will agree with that. Uh, I am actually at the moment writing a book about it. So it's giving me a lot to think about. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. I don't know whether we can continue. Robert, are you around there? Katia needs to leave us. Uh, yes, thank you, Katia. Continue. Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to dial off. I'm afraid I have to dial off too, Laura. But um, yeah. uh, it's thank you very much. I think I would just, you know, beauty. Beauty is an interesting word, isn't it? It sort of conjures up all sorts of things. I think the Vitruvian principles of firmness, commodity, and delight. Mm -hmm. Actually, if we return to those, are meaningful in this regard. And you know, having having been involved in in many projects, you know, prior to this role, and for example when we were when I'd be sort of chairing design review panels we, I would often ask the question you know um a sort of the question of delight and beauty um I think is relevant for us which is does this does this um um scheme actually really address the community um uh does it sort of lift the spirits um and I think those are things that are relevant but they but they also are about getting the, the 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 essence of the scheme right, the quality of the streetscape, the quality of the frontage, the, the the consideration of massing, the consideration of landscape. It is all of these things. But then always asking ourselves the question: Is this is this actually design that is that that actually adds something extra? Where's the added value? So yes. Great. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you very and, much, uh, Laura. You have to go. Um, Thanks a lot. Probably see take you. Take care. Uh, Bye. Bye. Yeah. I'm going to try to round up now because a lot of people are logging off because they have meetings. So it's, I don't think it's very fair. But what, what I'm suggesting, I don't know, Robert, if you're up for this, is going through these comments and trying to sort up a further event uh, to discuss what, was, what were the major comments uh, further. And I'm going to leave everybody with a thought. In my opinion, design quality is measurable. It's something that we can uh, look at how we appraise. Whilst beauty is a combination of the design quality um, variables that we can measure and a cultural process which involves more of a cognitive appreciation of space. So you, you perceive the space and you go through all of your cultural background, your individual preferences, and you define what quality, what, what beauty is individually. So that's, that's my thought for the day, but I would be very happy to come back and talk about it uh, in further detail. Thank you, Matthew. Thank, thank you, Alan and, and Robert there for being around. Any Anybody else wants to add anything before we leave? Do read the report. Um, there's lots in there. Um, I, I, I think it's all about building a culture across this country, um, nationally, but also locally. And we can't do that unless we have the right skills in the right places in the public sector. Uh, it's really, really critical. Um, so uh, I think we need to keep on fighting for that. Thank you. We will. We will read that. I promise. As soon as I come back from the beach. See you all. <laughs>